the stories this morning. And uh, just, I just wanted to say as I'm listening in the back, like, this is, it's so unusual. Okay, and to not get, like, used to that at all. Um, it's so uncommon to have just so many testimonies from anybody in this room of how the Lord is moving. Um, it's very, very uncommon. And God is doing something special. And to continue to give him praise for that, just of how much he's moving. And uh, what you get to be a part of, I think, is just so special. And so, uh, yeah, I was really blessed by that this morning, just to hear all of you guys' testimony. So time wasn't taken away at all. Um, it was a wonderful time to praise, and especially on Easter weekend. Yeah. You know, like, just such an ideal time, right? It was just the, the perfect timing. So, um, yeah. Well, I'm excited to be here. Um, thank you, Yaka, for the great introduction. Um, this is going to be a fun week as we go through the writings of John. We're going to have a good time covering uh, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation this week. And we're going to um, get into as much as we can with these books. And if you guys have questions as we go along, please ask them. I know that you guys have read all of them already, right? You finished Revelation like on Thursday last week, I think. So um, we're in a good place for talking about these books and what you guys already know. So... <clears throat> Uh, we'll walk through the books um, pretty systematically, uh, just how we'll teach the books this week, and um, so it should be pretty straightforward. But yeah, if you guys have questions as we go along, then please ask them. And I look forward to spending time with you guys this week, getting to know you, um, and eating meals together, and all that kind of stuff. So it'll be a fun, fun time this week. All right. Um, so this is my family. Aww. That's us at Christmas time. Uh, this is my wife, Miji, and our son, Alexander. Um, he is three years old. This is, uh, just, he just started preschool, um, and uh, he is a goofball. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's really big. He's really big for three years old. He's the height of about a four-and-a-half-year-old, actually. So, um, yeah, he's a really big kid. Um, but, yeah, this is my family. Uh, they're back in Kona right now. Miji and I have will be um, have been married six years in Yay. June, and uh, Alexander joined us um, three years in. So um, yeah, he's three years old right now, and we're involved with the School of Biblical Studies in Kona, and uh, I've been with YWAM since 2009. I did my DTS in Kona, and then staffed DTS for six years. Um, staff, uh, leading schools, staffing schools, going outreaches, that kind of stuff, and then made a transition into more biblical studies with YWAM, and have been then working with SBS, DBS, BCC, and a variety of other schools and roles. And really, the vision the Lord has given to me, and what uh, I hope to impart to you guys this week, is just the need for people to know the Word of God. Amen. Yeah. It is absolutely so essential for us in our ministry that people know and understand the Word of God and that we are discipling according to the Word of God. Because the reality is, is amongst Christians right now, there has never been a time in history where the Bible and understanding of the Bible has been so readily available to any Christian worldwide. Mm -hmm. And yet, the rates of biblical literacy are absolutely astounding. Yeah. <clears throat> Any, any English-speaking Christian can get a seminary education by themselves in their uh, office or bedroom just by ordering a few books online. And yet, the average Christian will read the only, it's, sorry, it's only about 5% of Christians or 10% of Christians that will read the Bible once in their lifetime. 5% will read it twice or more. If three times or more, it goes down below 1%. Wow. That will just read the Bible. Not, not read other things, other get understanding, but the whole Bible through it. Right? So what you guys are doing is already will have put you in the 10% of Christians worldwide. That's crazy. To have read the whole Bible. Wow. Okay? And it is. It's really sad. Because to do what Jesus has called us to do properly, we have to know his word. When Jesus is with his disciples, one of the last things that he leaves with them at the end of the book of Matthew is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Would someone read this for us? Jesus came and said to them, All of our demon heaven and earth has been given to you. But 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, obey, all that I have commanded to you, and with you always to the end of the age. Thank you. What are the instructions Jesus gives to his disciples? So just tell me. To make disciples? To go. To teach. Yes, to teach. And to observe. Okay. In this passage, there's only one command. In the Greek, the imperative which is the com- when you give somebody a command, there's only one command, and it's to make disciples. The, the word go is, it can be translated just going. Wherever you go, whenever you go, wherever you go, that idea is just, you are to make disciples. Okay? Jesus' command to his disciples, to us, is to go and make more disciples. Right? Now, Nowhere in the New Testament will it say, just go and get people saved. It says, go and make disciples. Yeah. Right. And that starts with this, baptism. Now, nobody is baptized unless they've committed their life to Christ. Right? Yeah. That's, that's natural. Right? You have to share the gospel with somebody. Their commitment is to Christ, and they're baptized. But that's not discipleship. Yeah. Right? That's only the first step. Yeah. Jesus then says to teach. Now, there's a lot of Christians will say, like, oh, we do this pretty well. But Jesus didn't say just to teach people to understand. Yes. Right? He said to teach them to what? Obey. Teach them to obey. Okay. Now, what does he say to teach them to obey? Everything. Everything that he's commanded. One of the biggest dangers that we can get into is that when we go and make disciples, we just tell them what the speaker told us. Mm-hmm. And what ends up happening is we go and make disciples in the image of the speaker. And the reason we have to know what the Bible says is because of what Jesus told us to do. Is that we can't actually make disciples the way he wants us to unless we know what he has said. And the most important thing a Christian can do with their life is to know the word of God so they can actually make disciples correctly. And so this, this whole concept here, it doesn't stop with just sharing the gospel with someone, it always must move to teaching them how to live the way Christ called us to live. Yes. Teach to obey. Mm-hmm. Now, the, what I love Gabe saying about consistency, because this is, that's what this is. Making disciples is consistency, right? It doesn't just you know, show up and blow up this kind of <laughs> baptism deal, but moving to the place of actually instructing people how to live the way Christ called them to live. That is what it means to make disciples. And teaching people to obey what Jesus said is so essential. Now, you guys, I'm sure, all know your love language, right? You know, words of affirmation, I am, uh, gifts is my love language. You guys know what God's love language is? Obedience. Obedience. Right? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Amen. Come on. Right? John 14, 15. In John 15, 10, Jesus says, you abide through obedience. All sorts of people are going to say all sorts of different things. You abide in prayer. You abide in worship. And those are ways that we come to seek God. But it's not abiding until we're obeying. (laughs) Because that's what Jesus said. Anybody who defines it another way is defining it not in accordance with what the word of God says. And so this is why, again, why it's so important to know what the Bible says, so you're actually defining things the way that God defines them. Yes. Because I, I don't know if you guys know, like, we all want to be friends with Jesus, right? Yes. I don't think anybody in this room doesn't want to be Jesus' friend. Yes. Okay? Do you know Jesus' friendship is conditional? Yes. Jesus is not a friend with whoever wants to be friends with him. Yeah. In John 15, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Yes. So thus, if you are not doing what Jesus asks, then you're not his friend. As much as we might want to be. Now, I hate to break it to you, it's what the Bible says. You know, I'm not up here just like, this is what Christopher thinks, right? This is what the Bible says. 
And so we have got to know what the Word of God says so we're living rightly before God. Right? So, so important. And so the great thing is, is obeying Jesus is not burdensome. Right? 1 John chapter 5, verse 2. It is not a burden to be obedient to God. In fact, it's a joy. It's a joy to be obedient, to walk with him. Um, And so this is is where we're going this week uh, with this book. Um, As we look at making disciples, we'll see in John how John lays that out and what that should look like for us. Because Jesus is so specific in the Gospel of John, what it means to live for him, what it means to walk with him. And a lot of passages quoted just came straight from John. So as we look at the Gospel of John, uh, one of the things that stands out about the Gospel is how much it is connected with the New Testament, or with the Old Testament. That, I think, amongst any book in the New Testament, the Gospel of John connects the most specifically. That the way that Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament story the way that he is carrying on what God was doing in the Old Testament is so specifically laid out in the Gospel of John. And it is, of course, an incredibly unique Gospel. John is filling in the gaps that the other Gospels have left. Um, John is probably writing his Gospel about maybe 40 years after the other Gospels have been written. Okay? So he's writing quite a ways later. He's aware of what they wrote. He's aware of the stories that were in there, how they were recorded. And so he's recording a very different story of Jesus and presenting him in a different light. Okay? And so one of the ways he's doing that is, of course, through the Old Testament. And so we'll highlight a lot of these Old Testament connections. But the better that we understand the story of the Old Testament, the better we will understand the Gospel of John. And that will go the same thing with Revelation. We'll look at that later on this week. But what are some of the things that stood out to you guys from the Gospel of John when you were reading it? I know it's probably like five days ago now, but... Yeah. Um, I just saw how this account of Jesus' resurrection was so different from the other three Gospels. Mm. Um, yeah, so I was also trying to fill in the gap to that, but it's, yeah. it's definitely different from the other. Yeah. What kind of things stood out to you that were different? Um, just like how he first communicated, I think how Mary came to the tomb and she saw it was empty and she went mm. back sad. Mm-hmm. And then Peter came and John came. Um, and then afterwards, it speaks of Mary again coming, mm-hmm. and then um, meeting Jesus as the garden, and how yeah. someone picks it up. So, and the other accounts doesn't explain it that, in no. that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is a, one example of how John is filling in the gaps mm-hmm. that other gospels have not left out, but we're not prioritizing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think I could be wrong. I'm just making a shot. I feel like where the three are accounts, I know John's an account, but it feels like it's a lot more theological, like the way that he writes about things is way more like, I don't know how to describe it, but it just seems like it's more of a theology than just an account. Yeah. And it seems like he spends more time writing about really relational moments of Jesus. Yes. Yeah, John is going to be really specific with what he includes. And we'll look at that. Um, how John is talking about that as we get into this morning a little bit. Because, yes, he is very, very specific with his intentions on why he includes what he includes. Mm -hmm. One other person. Yeah. Um, This is probably just exposing my own heart, but I always notice in John how he just always, like, kind of subtly sheds a light on himself with, like, the one who Jesus loved. (laughs) Yeah. Like, he was, like, the favorite or... (laughs) Yeah, so... I always just notice that and always wonder, like, why does he do that? He's the only apostle left alive. No one's going to confront him on it. Like, I don't know you know? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, for sure. Yeah, from, yeah, so the, this, this disciple who shows up just as the disciple whom Jesus loved or this other disciple um, shows up from chapters 13 through 21. And, uh, yeah, we get some... Some fun interactions, we'll highlight some of those as we go through. Yeah, good. Great. So yeah, the Gospel of John um, is incredibly unique and is very purposeful in what it is presenting. Um, in church history, it's been called the first fruits of the Gospels, just because of um, how powerful it is. Um, others have called it the spiritual Gospel. 
because of the presentation of Jesus is just so much different than what the other Gospels are trying to present, where John's Gospel seems a lot more relational, the other Gospels seem a lot more missional. Um, Jesus is very action-oriented in what he's doing and where he's going and accomplishing things, where the Gospel of John seems like Jesus just has conversations all the time, and all he ever does is talk to people, right? Um, so there are uh, only a couple of stories that are repeated throughout these Gospels. Um, and yeah, John writes a, a really fun story. So let's look at John a little bit. We're going to talk just about the author himself um, and what he has to say about himself so we can get a good idea of where he's coming from in preparing this gospel. So as we look at the author, uh, we see at the end that this disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who follows after Peter and Jesus walking in the last chapter, and he leans back on Jesus at the Last Supper, he is the one bearing witness to these things, right? So he's the one who says, I am the one who is testifying to this story. So as he's the one testifying to the story, we see some things about him. We know um, in chapter 13, verse 25, he's leaning, leaning back on the bosom of Jesus. Now, to us that might seem weird, but in the way that people would eat in the ancient world, they would usually recline at a table. They wouldn't sit in chairs. So if you've been to the Middle East and you've eaten dinner at somebody's house, you might have been at a table that's only a few inches off the ground. And when you sit, uh, at least in Jesus' time, um, you would sit on pillows and you would sit with your shoulders towards the table. Um, so we'd be sitting like this. And so for John to lean back on Jesus is not unusual, right? It's how you would talk to somebody, right? So um, John is sitting next to Jesus. We see uh, in chapter 19 as well that he is at the foot of the cross. So he's the only disciple who's there at the crucifixion of Jesus. And Jesus speaks to John while he's on the cross, or this disciple. And then in chapter 20, like was mentioned, he runs to the tomb. In uh, chapter 20, he lets us know as well that he ran there first and was faster than Peter. So it's always important to brag a little bit. Um, And uh, it's funny, in chapter 20 of John, there's more running in that chapter than anywhere else in the whole Bible. Wow. So there you go, fun fact. Um, And then in chapter 21, we see it. The, the nearness that this disciple feels with Jesus, that he can even eavesdrop on a private conversation he's having with Peter, right? So there is this closeness that he experiences. And he writes in such a way that carries this heavy Jewish atmosphere in the gospel, as we mentioned, just this strong tie-in with the Old Testament, and we'll sh- highlight how those things play out in the gospel as we go along. Now, When we think of the disciples who are the closest to Jesus, who are the ones that we think of? James, Peter, and John. John. Why why do we think of them as the closest? Transfiguration. Transfiguration. Yeah. So these guys go up the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, um, and they see Jesus transfigured in that moment in his glorious humanity. And important to know, Jesus is not being transfigured into deity on the Mount of Transfiguration. How do we know that? Because Elijah and Moses also show up glowing. Okay, so it's not the fact that he's glowing that makes him divine. This is an a ex, a expression of his divine humanity. Okay. When the church wanted to look at the divinity of Jesus displayed in some moment, they looked at the crucifixion, not the transfiguration. Okay. Just a, a point of interest for us there. So the closest disciples are these three. Now, we don't think Peter is the one who's writing the Gospel of John because... Uh, He is mentioned so many times by name. Uh, James also, um, while he's not mentioned in the gospel, he does die pretty early. Uh, Acts chapter 12, if you remember, he's beheaded by Herod. Okay, so he is martyred pretty early on in church history, and the gospel of John comes to us quite late. So we think it's the uh, apostle John because of the nearness uh, in ministry with Jesus, just the relationship that he had with Jesus. Um, and church history connection as well. The other interesting thing about just names in the Gospel of John is that while John the Baptist is called John the Baptist in all the synoptic Gospels, in the Gospel of John, he's just called John. Now, when John has other people mentioned, like Judas, he always says, like, Judas, uh, son of Iscariot, or Judas, not Iscariot. So he's, he's sure to qualify who he's talking about because there's multiple of them. But John, he doesn't because there's only one John. And so it seems like maybe he's leaving himself out on purpose. Um, But the early church tradition uh, 
says it is John the son of Zebedee, and that as John <clears throat> goes away after the ascension of Christ, that John actually takes care of Mary the rest of her life. Wow. Okay? So Jesus on the cross had said, son, here's your mother, mother, here's your son, to this disciple. And then church history tells us that John took care of Mary the rest of her life. He took her into his home. He looked after her. He provided for her. And then he moved to Ephesus with her. So across the Mediterranean from Israel, he moved to Ephesus, and that's where John and Mary both died. And um, there's tombs for both of them in Ephesus as well. And so John uh, was part of the early church leadership in the city of Ephesus. It's going to be where he has a mar or a execution attempt made on his life, where he is thrown into a pot of boiling oil and lives isn't burned. And they're like, well, what do you do with the man you can't kill? You send him to an island. And so they sent him to the island of Patmos, which is where uh, he has the vision of Revelation, which we'll talk about at the end of this week. Now, <clears throat> John, of course, uh, is part of that church in Ephesus, and he's the only apostle to actually die of old age or natural causes. All the other apostles are martyred. And uh, John lives a very long life. And so this quote comes from a commentary that was written in the early church about, and it mentions John, so I just want to read this quote to you guys. It said, Bless, the blessed John the Evangelist lived in Ephesus until extreme old age. His disciples could barely carry him to church, and he could not muster the voice to speak many words. During individual gatherings, he usually said nothing but, little children love one another. The disciples and brothers in attendance annoyed because they always heard the same words, finally said, teacher, why do you always say this? And he replied with a line worthy of John, because it is the Lord's commandment, and if it alone is kept, it is sufficient. Okay, so that's John for us, right? as just a, a person. So you guys going to get the idea of his character, his life, and what then he's presenting of Jesus in this gospel. Okay. Now, talk about uh, where it was written from. Um, we see it, the, the Greek and Jewish themes very heavy in the early churches. There is a strong um, contingent of both uh, Gentile and Jew in the early church as it is growing. And John probably writes this gospel before 100 AD. Um, his death is put around that time. And the gospel begins to spread around the world. Now, the earliest copy that we have of any biblical manuscript is the Gospel of John. It comes from John chapter 18, and it is called the Ryland's Fragment. Um, in uh, scholarly terms, it's referred to as P52, or, yeah, P52. And uh, it is about the size of the palm of my hand. Wow. It was found in Egypt um, in the last century, and it is the earliest copy of any biblical writings that we have from the New Testament. Okay, from the New Testament. Yeah, Dead Sea Scrolls are some of the oldest that we have in the Old Testament. Uh, but in the New Testament, this is the earliest that we have. And this gave us about 75 years earlier than our earliest manuscript at that time. Wow. Okay, so so it is, it's a lot, yeah. Now, some people will, will date this um, to as early as 110, but... What we see with this is that the Gospel of John is spreading widely, and church writings spread quite quickly and quite widely throughout the Mediterranean world, and so John's Gospel gets copied down and, and sent to Egypt. Thankfully, Egypt is a very dry place, very arid, and so papyrus even lasts 2,000 years there, and so the places where they're finding this papyrus is in ancient garbage dumps, um, where someone was using it as like an IOU because all the ink had faded and then they're able to restore the ink and pull it back out. And so that's how we're getting a lot of our most ancient biblical manuscripts. Now, the Gospel of John, its earliest reference is by um, other early church fathers writing in about 110. And so those guys are mentioning the Gospel of John as well, as, as well as a lot of Paul's letters, but um, for our sake here, the Gospel of John. And so it's very likely that John is writing somewhere in the 80s or 90s A.D., very close to the end of the first century, and probably from Ephesus as well. So let's look at the original readers. 
who are the people who are reading this and why is it written to them? Okay, now with every ancient book, uh, any book really, you're wanting to think about who is this written to and why is the author writing it? Because that's going to tell you a lot about why they included what they included, what John's purpose was, and so you can read the book correctly and well. So with the original readers, which these are um, actual paintings from the first century, so those are Romans in the first century. Um, <clears throat> We see with these guys, they're facing persecution from probably their local synagogues, being kicked out of the synagogues. There's no other gospel or any other place in the New Testament that mentions this idea of being put out of the synagogue, which comes up four times in the Gospel of John. And this is uh, very likely what's happening in their situation wherever they are that John is facing. We see a lot of uh, explanation of Hebrew terms, Hebrew words, or Aramaic words, and so it's likely that John is writing to both a very Jewish audience that would have understood those things, understood the context for all these things, but also for a very Gentile audience as well, who needs some explanation on these things. So we get that, again, this heavy Jewish feel going on. Now, if we're thinking about these, the gospel coming in the end of the first century, the church has been around by that time, for roughly about 65 to 70 years. So you're having people in the church who are already third generation Christians. Wow. Okay. And there might need to be an affirmation of their faith, why they believe what they believe, and where all of that came from. Now they have the other gospels, they have some other writings. And so John's very intentional with this. And we ask, I think the good question to ask, well, why do we need another gospel? There's already three really good Gospels out there. Why do we need one more? And John tells us exactly why he's writing this Gospel at the end. Now, not a lot of authors do this, but John does, very thankfully. And so the closing lines of the Gospel, uh, because I'll treat uh, chapter 21 as an appendix written by John after his publishing of the Gospel. He says in verse 30, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Okay. So John says, the reason I've recorded the things I have recorded is so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Okay. So it's an affirmation of their faith and also evangelistic tool. The thing about the Gospels that's important for all of us to know is that all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are written to Christians. Okay? They're not written primarily as evangelistic tracts. They're written to Christians to affirm their faith and to teach them about who Jesus is. <clears throat> so John has the same kind of idea. And so with that then, he says in here, there's other, go other miracles recorded in other places. My goal is not to give you the life testimony of Jesus. My goal is to record something very specific to show you that Jesus is the Christ. And so with that, then, he's probably writing to a Jewish audience, a primarily Jewish audience, because the Gentiles are not looking for a Christ. The word Christ is the same as Messiah. It just means anointed one. And so the Gentiles don't care, right? When Paul preaches the gospel to the Jews, he convinces them that Jesus is the Christ by showing them his descendancy through the line of David and how he is the rightful king and the Messiah. When he preaches the gospel to Gentiles, he tells them about the benevolence of God, how good God is, how much he's taken care of them and loved them. And even when they hated him and didn't know him, God still looked after them. So Paul preaches the gospel differently to different people. So if John's goal is to prove that Jesus is the Christ, then he's probably writing primarily to Jews. Yeah. And that explains a lot of why the gospel is written in the way that it is written. <clears throat> Now, the readers are important, but knowing the context of the people in the story is incredibly significant as well. So I know you guys did the Jesus Week quite a while ago, but we'll talk about some of the things from the Gospels here to get some refreshing. Yeah. Please. Um, so I had read somewhere that part of the writing this was like to address Gnosticism. Mm. Was that something that was more with the Greeks, so that's why they're included, or is that something that you think Jews and people were also struggling with? Yeah. yeah Have you guys talked about Gnosticism? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Maybe a little bit. Yeah. 
Okay. So <clears throat> let's do like a like brief crash course Gnosticism. Okay. So Gnostics never call themselves Gnostics. Okay. So the only people who call them Gnostics are Christians who are trying to define a heresy. Okay. So Gnosticism has a lot of varying early teachings, and it's really, really hard to nail down how it started, when it started, and at what stages it's at in the first century. So Gnosticism, by the early second century, which means like the 120s to 130s AD, is really starting to be much more formed and solidified. But in the first century, Gnosticism is kind of all over the place. And more of what people will look at as being maybe a, a solidified heresy that people are addressing would be something called Docetism and Serinthianism, which we will talk about in 1 John specifically. So don't worry about those terms right now. We will talk about that this week. Um, <clears throat> but because Gnosticism is incip or incipient, which is like early stages, like the baby stages, it's hard to say exactly if what they're addressing is Gnostic or if it's just um, Docetism, but more likely it's Docetism, um, which we'll, we'll explain, I'll explain a little bit um, here in just a bit, but um, <clears throat> yes. So it's, it's tough to nail down. So I would side more with other heresies that are being addressed than Gnosticism specifically, because what most people will talk about with Gnosticism is that, um, you know, Jesus maybe didn't come in the flesh, he came as a spirit, um, or that he came to reveal a secret knowledge to certain people, and that there's only certain people who have a secret knowledge, which is a teaching of Gnosticism, and that, uh, that Yahweh is an evil descendant of the true God, but that Jesus is connected to the true God and trying to lead people back to God, not to Yahweh. And so there's all these, all sorts of different things, but these come from a variety of different veins that then lead into more of a um, unified belief system, but it's unclear if it started with Christians or with Jews. And so the the belief system then of uh, <clears throat> of Gnosticism ties very closely into Christianity because of a lot of the things that were believed. But have you guys heard, did anybody mention um, mystery religions at all? So, okay, so mystery religions are exactly what they are. They're mysteries. But um, what... <laughs> The essential, the essential truth of a mystery religion is that they claim to have the secrets of life. And that then, as they claim to have the secrets of life, people would um, join these various cults, and you can be involved in a variety of them. It's not like today, where it's like one exclusive religion. It's like, you do everything you can. Like, you worship all the gods, because you don't know which one you're going to anger, so you just make sure you cover all your bases. So, with the, the mystery religions... They, they believed they had the secrets of life. And so they would, the people who would join them, and they could only join at certain times in the year, usually they would have one or two inductions into the cult per year. And you would go through various steps into the cult. And there, there's things like um, being blindfolded and uh, led through an obstacle course and being beaten at various points with whips or sticks and this kind of thing. Um, there was like rape that would happen in these things. There's all sorts of various things, but you get to the end and they show you what they claim to be or reveal to you what is the secret of life. Wow. The only one that we know about, um, anything about, because you're also sworn to secrecy. If you revealed this, then you would not be promised that life in the end or you would be killed for it. Okay. So <clears throat> the only one we know about is called the Eleusinian Mysteries. And it was around for like 600 years. And you go through all these induction initiation processes over the course of years to get to this point where they lead you down this dark tunnel, blindfolded, and into a room where there's one pinhole of light that's shining down upon what they claim to be the secret of life. And you come to the room, and they take off your blindfold, and hanging from the ceiling, shining in the light, is an ear of corn. Wow. And you know, the only reason we know about that is because some guy got to the end and was like, this is dumb. <laughs> and he's like, I'm going to write everything about this. Just, I'm sure that that's the only reason we know about it. Because he's like, this is absurd, right? So, so all that to be said, there's like so much, so much 
uncertainty, so much mystery. There's a lot of dynamics and belief systems and things going on um, at the time. And with the, uh, with the Gnostics, it's hard to nail things down sometimes just because they don't call themselves Gnostics. And so the only reason we know they're called Gnostics is because people like early, the early church father Irenaeus writes about them and he calls, he writes a book called Against Heretics and calls them Gnostics. And then he lays out kind of what they believe. And because, based off of that, then we can look at these groups, for example, a group in Egypt at a place called Nag Hammadi, and say, okay, well, all of what they wrote about and what they believe lines up with what Irenaeus was writing about and calling these people Gnostics. So that's kind of how we find these kind of things. So. But yeah, anyways, it's very, very small at the time. Okay. So let's talk about the people in the story, uh, the audience or the hearers. Do you guys know what the important sects were in the first century? Pharisees. Pharisees, good. Sadducees. Sadducees, great. So those are the two primary ones that we will um, interact with in any of the Gospels are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There's a couple others, um, the Essenes and the Zealots, which don't, don't uh, the Zealots only come up once with Simon the Zealot. Okay, then, and so there's not a lot of impact from these guys. And the Essenes are a very um, secluded, hidden community. Some people think John the Baptist was an Essene. Um, but they don't really bear a lot of impact on the Gospels. But the Pharisees and Sadducees are quite important. What do you guys know about the Pharisees? Teachers. Okay, they're good. They're teachers? Traditional? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so they wanted to keep the law. And uh, they really wanted to keep the law because, as you guys know, the people went into exile because of really dramatic idolatry. Yes. Right, And then when they come back from exile, instead of coming back to this kind of like middle ground of saying, okay, let's love the Lord, let's obey the law, walk as close as we can to the covenant, they kind of swing to the other side of extreme legalism and say, okay, we're going to take the law, we're going to add to it. Okay? And we, we say they put a fence around the law. So if we draw our Ten Commandments here, or our two tablets, I should say. They, they take the two tablets and they put a fence around it. Okay, And... <clears throat> They, they call it this. They say they are fencing in the law to protect it. So when, and this is all done with a really good heart, okay? When we look at this, we, like, we think of like, oh, they're so legalistic, they're so extreme. But if you think about like, if God says honor the Sabbath, we all love God, right? I want to do what he asked me to do. Okay, how do I honor the Sabbath? Okay, well, if God says honor the Sabbath, and Sabbath means rest or ceasing from work, then what kind of work do I need to cease from? Okay. And what does it mean to cease from work? And how do I do that exactly? And what qualifies as work and not as work? So if I light a fire on the Sabbath, then I'm working. So I've got to be careful not to light a fire on the Sabbath. And if I cook or cut vegetables or something like that, then I'm, I'm doing some kind of work. I'm exerting some energy, and so I'm not going to do that. I'll prepare all my meals ahead of time. And how far is it before? How far can I walk before I start working to my walking? And, and so all of these kind of extra things that came in is all from the primary intention of, I want to obey God as well as I possibly can. And so their heart is really, really good, but they've missed God's heart in the law. Right? And, that, and so they've added all these extra things. So this is called um, oral tradition. There's a lot of it. It's handed down in the Talmud. And... Basically, it's all the extra instructions of how do you actually keep the law correctly okay. and in all the different contexts. Because if you guys think about it, 613 laws in the Old Testament is not enough to run a nation. Anybody who has studied law at all knows that that's hardly scratching the surface. When you think of property law, there are books and books and books just on property law. Right, And so 613 laws, is it's nothing. So you take that 613 laws, you can say, this is the essence of what God desires, and then how do we take that and build on that? Okay. So that we actually are obeying God well and correctly as best we possibly can. So that's, that's the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees, with that idea, <clears throat> Jesus interacts with the Pharisees more than any other sect. And people think that, think the reason is, is because... Jesus and the Pharisees agree on the most things. Wow. Jesus and the Sadducees don't agree on very much. 
But Jesus talks to the Pharisees so much because they're so close to the kingdom of God. They're like right on the brink. And that's why in Acts you see Pharisees coming to Christ. It's why Paul, a Pharisee, comes to Christ and becomes the greatest evangelist of the early church. The Pharisees are so close. And these guys are not an official, like, sanctioned sect. These guys devote their lives to serving God as best as they possibly can. As studiers of the Bible, you all in this room are Pharisees. And we use it as a derogatory term. We use it as a derogatory term. And it's, it's sad because we only look at them as people that Jesus is attacking. Why does Jesus attack them so much? Because they're so close. First, second, uh, sorry, First Peter chapter 5 says judgment starts at the house of God. Right? It is in the house of God that he first begins to cleanse before he cleanses the world. Right? And so they're so close, right? And Jesus interacts with them because they're right on the brink there. Now, not all of them have great hearts, but you see one of the first Pharisees Jesus interacts with, interacts with in the Gospel of John is who? Nicodemus, right? And he ends up being one of the guys at the end who contributes the largest to Jesus' uh, burial, right? Joseph of Arimathea is on the council of the Sanhedrin, which means that he's probably a Pharisee. Okay. So there are people who believe Jesus, right, amongst the Pharisees. Okay. <clears throat> so the the Pharisees are this, they're kind of like a religious pressure group a little bit, because they're not like a sanctioned sect, right? Um, so, yeah, there there are guys. Now, they believe in uh, the whole Old Testament scripture, that all of it is authoritative. They believe in the spiritual world, angels, demons, all the rest. Um, and <clears throat> uh, the Sadducees don't. Okay, the Sadducees do not, oh, and the Pharisees, sorry, the, the last thing I'll say on that is that the Pharisees believe in the resurrection. Yeah. Okay, they believe that there will be a resurrection at, at the future point in time. Okay. The Sadducees deny that. There is not going to be a resurrection. Once you die, you're dead. Okay. They only take the first five books to be authoritative. They take all the other books to be important, like everything from Joshua to Malachi is important, but it's not authoritative. That's why they don't believe in the resurrection, which is why they come to Jesus and ask him, you know, the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection are asking about the resurrection in all the Gospels. And Jesus is like, you guys are dumb, right? Because in the book of Exodus, God's already kind of talking about it. And so he uses their scripture to back up his belief, right? That's why that's such a powerful story. So um, they deny the spiritual realm as well, angels, demons, all the rest. Um, and they tend to be of the wealthy elite class where the Pharisees are, will generally come from the more blue-collar population. Okay, Sadducees are going to be mostly amongst the priestly class, which are the elites and the higher in society. The Pharisees really distaste uh, the Romans. They do not like Roman occupation whatsoever, and they're looking for Messiah to take over and uh, conquer the Romans. The Sadducees like the Romans. They work hand-in-hand -hand with the Romans. They're very buddy-buddy with them um, because they're working together in prosperity, and in corruption. All right. So then, what's the expectation of the Messiah? What do people expect the Messiah to be like? Political. Political Messiah, yeah. Okay. They want him to be king. That's why in John chapter 6, it says after he was feeding them, they tried to take him and make him king. Okay. There is this phrase might not carry very much into South Africans, but for Americans, there the perspective of Israel is like this. Make Israel great again. Okay. Make Israel great again. That's the that's their whole perspective, right? That's their desire, right? Make Israel great again. And how are we going to do that? Through a warrior that will rise up and overthrow the Romans. Okay. When Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, what are they shouting? Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. Do you know what Hosanna means? It means save us. They're not saying save us from our sin. They're saying save us from the Romans. The son of David is the proper king. Hosanna to the son of David. Okay. And 
when James and John come to Jesus, before he comes to Jerusalem, do you, do you guys know when they, James and John come to Jesus after he's left Jericho and he's coming up to Jerusalem? That's about a 10 mile or 12 mile walk. Okay. They come to him and they say, because they knew that they were coming to Jerusalem, James and John came to Jesus and they asked him a question. Lord, when we come into your kingdom, can we sit at your right and left hand? Okay, we think that we're like, oh, in heaven, right? When Jesus comes into his throne room in, in heaven and then up there. No. They're thinking about Jerusalem. They're like, hey, we're going to get to Jerusalem in only a matter of hours. When we get there and you overthrow the Romans and you set your throne up in Jerusalem, can we sit next to you? And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking me. That's already been prepared for other people. Whoa. The two men who were crucified next to him at his right and left. Oh, right? Oh, so, <laughs> and how do, how do you know how do we know that that's the case? Because that is the moment of Jesus' exaltation to kingship is the cross. And so when he comes into his throne, that's that's when you see the people at the right and left hand that's been prepared for. Okay? Now when Jesus at the Last Supper in Luke, he says to his disciples, I had sent you out before and I said, don't take money, don't take a staff, don't take a knapsack. Now I'm telling you, get money, get a staff, and go and get swords. And, you're, and they're like, hey, we already have them. And you're like, why? Why do you already have swords? Because they think Jesus is going to overthrow the Romans. Why do you think Peter takes out a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane to slice off Malchus's ear? It's because he's trying to defend Jesus, not to keep him safe, but to overthrow the Romans. Right? You are arresting the Messiah. Okay. In the first century alone, or not first century, so from about the time, about a decade before Jesus was born, until 135 AD, there are 13 messianic figures. 13 people who, in that about 140 year period, who claim to be the Messiah. Twelve of those thirteen, all are violent revolutionaries. Only one of them comes to serve. Jesus and Jesus doesn't fit the bill. He doesn't look like everybody else in his actions, but in his character, in the way he's talking, people think he's the Messiah. When we think of Messiah, we think Savior from our sins. They're like, we got to make this guy king. That means give him a sword and a shield. Okay? They're thinking of Jesus as a, a warrior. Okay? That's, that's their perspective. So that's what, when we hear this kind of idea here of Messiah, of, uh, of him coming into his kingdom, of coming to Jerusalem, wow. him flipping the tables is part of the reformation that kings would bring in a religious system. Right? You think of Hezekiah and Josiah. What did they do? They reformed the religious system. When Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he flips the tables, he's reforming the religious system. It's one of his first acts as king. Right? So these kind of things all are in line with what a king would do and what they would expect him to do. But his throne is a different throne. Do you think that expectation not being met would cause them to be angry? Just like when they're he's entering in Jerusalem and they're all like, save us, save us, they're like, they love him. But then when it comes to Pilate's trial, they're like, I don't think so. Um, the, I think they would be misunderstanding, which is the same thing with the disciples, right? Even the, the two men on the road to Emmaus, or potentially the man and wife on the road to Emmaus, um, as they're walking on the road, um, they, they're walking on the road and they're sad. Right? They, they, we expected Jesus to be the Messiah we were looking for. Yeah. Right? Um, and that, uh, I think that that's probably the more the response. Now, I don't think the crowds turn on Jesus at the uh, trial of Pilate. We'll highlight that. It's probably a very small group of people. It's probably only about 20 people who get Jesus crucified. So we'll talk about that when we get to John 19. Cool. Yeah. I just want to make you maybe... Just mention a couple of those revolutionists who translate with the Messiah, because I think it will help us just like understand more what they expected Jesus to be like. Mm. Why not for me? Yeah, so there's this guy, um, Simon the Galilean. Um, he uh, uh, had risen up, and about it was around the time Jesus was born, or a little after the time Jesus was born, 
um, Simon the Galilean rose up, and when he um, his revolution was overthrown by the Romans, all of him and his followers were crucified. So there was about 3,000 people who were nailed to trees along the roads of Jerusalem. Um, Simon Bar Kokhba, um, who is the last one in 135, um, his name means son of the star because they thought the, the light of the world, the son of the star, um, the morning star would be the Messiah. And so he comes and he, he is the light of Israel. And so he comes as this revolutionary and he's the last of them because after that time, Jerusalem is just decimated. There's nothing left. Um, and so he leads that last revolt in 135. Um, and the, those revolts are called the Simon Bar Kokhba revolts. Um, as well, the, do you guys know the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD and the destruction of the temple? We'll talk yeah. about that briefly. Um, <clears throat> so since that day, when the temple was burned to the ground and every stone was thrown down that Jesus had prophesied, the temple's never been rebuilt. 2,000 years later, it's never been rebuilt. Um, that whole scenario started because of one man claiming to be the Messiah. And then uh, at his claim to be the Messiah, they actually, uh, so there was a moment where the Romans marched into the temple precincts where they weren't supposed to be. And they, some Jews rebelled against them and killed them in that time. And then that kind of spurred on and started their revolts. Um, and so there was a couple people claiming to be a messianic figure at that time. And what Josephus tells us of the war of the Jews from about 66 to 70 AD is that more Jews were killed by each other than there were by the Romans. Wow. Because there was civil war inside of the city of Jerusalem. Wow. And so um, that, uh, and that's because there was multiple people on each side who had claimed to have the right to be the leader. So. Um, in the Messiah, yeah so that's one of the unique things in the gospel of John is that the way Jesus talks about himself as being God is unique because mm -hmm. um, saying like son of man which is the most common way that Jesus talks about himself is not a claim to deity um, it's a it's a claim to be the Messiah and they did not think the Messiah was God. That, that was not a correlation that they were making. Um, and, you know, for us, it's hard. Like, we have to take a step to grasp the humanity of Jesus, right? To think about the fact that Jesus was hungry, and if he didn't eat, would he starve to death? You know, like, he's, he feels pain and sorrow. Now, he, got, he probably got sick. He might have broken a bone when he was a kid. You know, like, who knows what, it, what happened to him in his life. He's a human being. And all of the disciples would have interacted with him that way. They would have understood. They would have seen him. They would have known. After, I think, and this is why The Chosen is so great, because it's like, after ministry, Jesus is tired. Have you guys watch The Chosen? And he's, like, ministering to all those people, and they're all in the camp, and Jesus kind of just, like, hanging his head. He goes, I'm going to go to the tent. You know, like, I'm, like, done. Worn out. He had energy that he spent. He was a human being. So for them to grasp the deity aspect takes a leap. For us to grab the humanity aspect takes a leap. Wow. Because they present him in such a strong sense of deity because they understood him so strongly as a human. Yeah. And so we can almost compromise the fact of his humanity because we so clearly see him presented in his deity. So we've got to have that balance, I think. Um, so there wasn't anybody else claiming to be God because that would have been a blasphemous statement, which is why then um, when, <clears throat> when Jesus says, and this isn't in this gospel, the other gospels, when Jesus is before Caiaphas, and he says, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Okay? And then Caiaphas tears his clothes, and he says he's spoken blasphemy. Okay? That's because that passage comes from Daniel 7. Okay, so when, when Jesus, when those passages in the Gospels talk about Jesus coming on the clouds, that's not talking about his second coming. Okay, that's, that's talking about his ascension to his rightful place on the throne. Okay, so Jesus says, I'm going to come on the clouds, or when you see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, that has nothing to do with his return. It is about his ascension to heaven, because Daniel chapter 7 talks about one like a son of man coming before the ancient of days on the clouds. 
And so that passage is a passage of this, de this uh, deity figure or divine figure. Jesus is saying, that's me. And that's why they're saying that's blasphemy. So that's the kind of ground or background for those passages. Yeah. There was other questions in the back. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, is this what um, in Acts 5, when Gamaliel is like, men just wait, don't do anything because there's been people from the past that have come and risen yes. up and they've all been... Exactly. Okay, so do you think, um, maybe, because there's two different hearers now, if we're looking at the book of John, but then we're also looking at the book of Acts, but it's still the same story. Mm -hmm. For those hearers, when they're seeing Jesus being crucified now, are the disciples going through, man, is he just like all of the others? Yes. Or, and That's then, why they're sad and they walk away. Yeah. And then also even the disciples, a lot of them are crucified, a lot of them are killed by their life, so... Mm -hmm. Is that what they're thinking even in the book of Acts? Is like actually maybe Gamaliel was right in what he was speaking? I don't know if they would have had if they would have known what Gamaliel had said. We're yeah. unsure of how they had heard that. Yeah. Potentially they only know that because Saul of Tarsus yeah. probably was there listening. That's true. And Luke, <laughs> writing the book of Acts, hears from Saul, who's now Paul, there was this one time in the Sanhedrin where Gamaliel stood up and said da 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 because Saul was Gamaliel's pupil. He studied, studied personally under Gamaliel. Wow. He sat at his feet. And so probably that's where you heard it from. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So how much the other apostles knew that, we don't know. Okay. Before the book of John, this is maybe what they're thinking back then. Yeah. Okay. Was there another question? Your question? No one hears. But it's not about, I think, I think you threw a curve a curveball in there. Mm. Okay. What you say about uh, the road to Amaras? Like, oh, the man and the wife? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, it, yeah. did it say two, the two men that were walking? I think it says the two were walking together. Does it say two men? Two of them. Yeah. So some people think it's a man and a wife. No one knows, though. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? It's a good time for a break. Let's take 10 minutes. Yes. Sure. Give me one second here. I just want to make sure I'm. This is the first session I've ever recorded, so I'm just trying to make sure I have my. I'm standing in the way of the camera. All right. That. Sorry, one second. <laughs> Sorry, your question. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Um, 
going to need the people that will need us and figure out when we should be planning meal plans with them and when we should just plan a cupboard for them to start making meal. I wonder if like Wow, I go in too fast.
Got it. Okay. Just about the upgrade. Like you said about the two crosses. Like that was the place. Ah, uh, yes. Like, was it just symbolic or what the guys like really? Was it just the one you actually want? Yes. Yeah. Well, in the, in the Gospels, you have uh, in Mark, they both reject Jesus. Yes. But it seems like. One of them that comes later is kind of repentant, you know. So okay. both of them at the beginning are very yes. much repentant. But yes, in Luke you get that story of repenting. Yeah. So, so that would be, you would say, like, not that you forgot to repent. Like, it's not. I don't think it's contradicting. I think it's a development to the story. So yeah. what Mark gives us is just the snapshot, where Luke gives us the whole picture of what happens. Yeah. And then, like, but then he's in the yeah, yeah, that's what Jesus says. Yeah, because that is seen as his influence. And so when Jesus says, well, I wouldn't even say it's, it's necessarily symbolic, because Jesus will say that's when I'll be lifted up. Hey guys, that's 10 minutes. So the cross is in the seat. It is his throne. And, and that's I think what we what we need to also that because the early church was as well. Yeah. In the writings of the church fathers, they were on their way. Once Jesus commands you, look at the transfiguration. So, and if you want to see the scene, I got a reverend rest tab for the men's this week. It's hard. They thought it was hard. But they could not deny what Jesus said. That's what we have to wrestle with. I will have to say. Yeah. Yes, as far as I know, it's yes, you're allowed any drink but only one of it. Yes. Yes, yeah, so ladies, don't forget about that tab that, that you have at Reven Re at Torah, not at Reven Reven. You have a Reven Reven. Yeah, yes. yes, okay, amazing. So we'll. Go ahead and jump into the next session. Those that are coming in will just miss amazing things. Um, and I don't want to take away from your time, so I'm just going to let you jump back in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we've got about an hour left. We're going to get through what we can. I hope that we'll get through the first chapter today. Um, but yes, that's what we're going to do. So I just want to set up kind of the context. We'll, when we get into it, we'll only look at certain things in the gospel. I'm not going to obviously talk through everything. But uh, some of the things I think are important to highlight. So um, when we think about the, the hearer's context, these people in the story, Jerusalem at the time, just kind of how the atmosphere of the city is incredibly turbulent. Okay? It is a, um, it's a city that is experiencing all sorts of upheaval, rebellion. Um, there is various <clears throat> moments of uprising that happen. Um, in fact, uh, there is a time where um, during... Uh, one of the governor's reigns, uh, where a Roman soldier uh, lifts up his clothes and flashes the the Jews going into the temple, and uh, then uh, he's executed by the the governor. Um, there's another time um, the governor takes money from the temple treasury to build an aqueduct for the city of Jerusalem, thinking he's going to bless the city, and then the Jews revolt against him. And so the atmosphere in the city, there's a lot of tension, a lot of tension. The Jews have never liked being ruled over, and uh, I mean, think rightfully so. And there is a, there's a lot of tension at the time of Jesus. So it's not just like everything's hunky-dory and it's all nice and, nice and fun in the city of Jerusalem when Jesus goes in. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so as we uh, transition in, we're going to look at a number of themes that come up in this book, some of the things that help us to understand what John is doing. And so these are the more the literary characteristics of the Gospel of John. So we get these I am statements throughout the Gospel. Okay? Now, we get these um, specifically in things like I am the bread of life, or I am the way, the truth, and the life, those kind of things. But we also get them in general statements as well. So when the woman at the well says, you know, I'm just going to wait for the Messiah, and then he'll be able to tell me, and Jesus says, I am he. But the phrase in Greek is just ego emi. Okay. So it's this phrase. Okay. 
ego and me, and it just means I am. And this is the way that the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, had translated when God says of his name in Exodus chapter 3, Yahweh. Right? It'll say, I am. Okay? And so when Jesus says, I am, it's a play on the fact of his claim towards deity. So Jesus says this as an, at a number of points throughout the gospel where it's just a general I am statement, but the English will often translate it as I am he because that's more grammatically correct, and that can be inferred from the statement um, because the in, Greek, in English we often are very uh, explicit with our pronoun usage. Right? If you just said, like, I am, that leaves it kind of ambiguous. I, you are what? Or, you know, um, but I am he, like, that's me. Um, we are much more explicit with it. Where Greek won't be, it'll just imply that. <clears throat> and we see some things happening at this. So, for example, in chapter 6, verse 20, when Jesus says, I am, the boat reaches the other side of the lake immediately. So it kind of maybe teleports there. Um, or in chapter 8, verse 58, when Jesus says, I am, uh, everybody picks up stones to stone him. So it's not just saying, I am he, it's like, I, it is a claim to divinity, okay? Um, or in chapter 18, uh, when Je they, uh, they come to arrest Jesus, and he says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus, he goes, I am, they all fall down, right? So um, those kind of things happen. Now, it probably wasn't maybe muddy out at the time, they didn't just slip, uh, but uh, they, they fell down with the weight of the statement, right? But we also get these I am statements that are characterized, okay? So they elaborate on something. So Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Now, each one of these phrases then elaborates a deeper truth or is relating to something potentially from the Old Testament, uh, and <clears throat> Jesus is trying to communicate a truth about himself in relation to the story of Israel. So the first one, I am the bread of life. Okay, relates to him being like Israel's manna in the wilderness that had come down from heaven. He says, I am the light of the world, which isn't a claim to be divine. Okay? So we talk about God being light, but when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, that's not a claim to be divine, that's a claim to be the Messiah. Because God had called Israel to be the light of the world. Okay? In the book of Isaiah. So Jesus is the light to Israel and the light to the rest of the world as well. <clears throat> Jesus says, I'm the gate of the sheep, or gate for the sheep. And Jesus says this before he says, I'm the good shepherd. Okay, so many people um, don't catch that. But Jesus says, I am the gate. And uh, it's this idea that all people can come in freely into the kingdom of God, but it is only through Jesus. Wow. Which then um, is elaborated on later on where Jesus says another statement. So he says he's the good shepherd. Now, when we think of shepherd, we think of somebody who cares for our hearts and leads us to great pastures. Psalm 23 but if you remember in the prophets, shepherds are constantly referred to as political leaders. Okay, Remember Ezekiel says, you have had bad shepherds, and I will raise up a, a good shepherd for you. So this word good is not like morally good. The word is like noble. Okay? So he is a, a good shepherd is this idea of kingship and leadership. <clears throat> He is the resurrection and the life. You know, pretty straightforward in the Gospel of John here. Uh, and he'll say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Again, uh, that no one, else, no one comes to the Father except through him, which is how he elaborates that statement in chapter 14. And uh, this word way uh, is the word that's also translated as road or path. And that's why Thomas says, well, how do we get there? Right? And he says, I am the road. Right? I am the path. And then the last one we get is, uh, I am the true vine. Now that, again, is a play off of Israel, because uh, they are called to be the vine. You remember Isaiah chapter 5, the parable of the vineyard, where Isaiah sings this song of the vineyard, and Israel is the vineyard. They are the vine. But Jesus now will say, I am the true vine. Okay, and we'll, we'll look at that uh, when we get there in chapter 15. <laughs> I can pass these slides on along as well. To you. Yeah, I, mean, so. I just would love some clarity um, a little bit more with the I am statements just to make sure of understanding. Mm -hmm. um, are the I am statements, some of them he is claiming to be God and some are not him claiming to be God? Or are, is he never actually claiming to be God? I, sorry. You'd want to look at the context okay. um, and how people interpret it. Okay. So, um, 
The one in John uh, eight fifty eight is almost surely that claim because of them picking up stones and yes. making himself kind of the same as God. So, okay. yeah. And you kind of get that idea in chapter 18. Okay. And the, it, the, I mean, the interesting thing, right, is that Jesus is in a garden and they're coming to look for him. And he says, I am, and they all fall down. Kind of the same way that God comes looking for Adam and Eve in a garden and they're hiding themselves. Yeah. Right, mm-hmm. them. So, you get that kind of parallel here. Um, yeah. <clears throat> the next is uh, this idea of a double entendre. And there's a French word that means when something has two meanings. Okay. Now, this is not reading into the text and trying to say, oh, there's a deeper spiritual meaning here. It is when a word has two different definitions and you use it in one way that can also be read another way. Okay. So these are two legitimate meanings, not a spiritualized or interpreted or secret meaning. Right. So the first one we see is born again. The word anothen in Greek can mean again or from above. So when Jesus says you must be born again, that's not what he means. Jesus, What Jesus means is you must be born from above. Nicodemus understands you must be born again. Yeah. Now we use that phrase in, in Christ, like Christianese to say you must be born again, right? But Jesus actually means you must be born from above to be part of the kingdom of God. We'll, we'll talk about kind of everything that's going on contextually in that chapter and that story. Jesus will say, um, talk about the temple, and the temple that is, he's referring to is his body, when he says, I'll tear down the temple and raise it up in three days, or, or it will be torn down and raised up in three days. Um, but they all think he's talking about the physical temple. The next is living water, where the woman thinks Jesus is talking about actual water, and Jesus is referring to the Spirit of God. This idea of food to eat, where the disciples think that Jesus is talking about actual lunch, and Jesus is really talking about doing the will of the Father. His flesh as bread. Him being crucified in chapter 12. Uh, we'll look at that one specifically. Uh, in 828, there seems to be this moment where Jesus is talking about going away, and they think, well, is he going to commit suicide? So that could be one um, where they misinterpret what he's saying. And then the kingdom, of course, um, in chapter 18, when he's talking with Pilate. So let's look at some of the uh, Old Testament connections here. <clears throat> okay, so we, we've highlighted the fact that there's a lot of Old Testament connections. Um, these specifically will link back to the Exodus story because, and I, I don't know how much, I, yeah, I don't know how much you guys have talked about certain things throughout your school, so I, I don't know where to gauge off of that, being now that it's the last week, but... Um, The Exodus story is the most important story in the Bible. Um, After, like, the book of Genesis is the introduction to uh, Exodus. Okay? That's the story. The reason we have Genesis is so that you understand what's going on in Exodus. Okay? So the Exodus story is the most important story in the Bible because it's then brought up in every book after that. Right? And the whole desire of God to bring his people back, to be in relationship with them, is exemplified through the Exodus story. Okay? When Jesus comes, the people are waiting for the next great Exodus. Yeah. The Exodus from the Romans, where God will free them from their oppressors, they will no longer be oppressed slaves to another empire, and they will be their own people in their own kingdom again. They're looking for the next great Exodus, and so Jesus is bringing the next great Exodus. And we'll see how that is highlighted throughout this book. But we get that with things like the signs. Okay? If you remember back to the book of Exodus, the plagues, do you anybody remember why God sent the plagues? To judge the gods of Egypt. Good. It's all in response to one question of Pharaoh. Who is the Lord? Okay? And then in Exodus chapter 9, Moses comes to Pharaoh and he says, on behalf of God... I could have killed you if I wanted to. I could have destroyed Egypt if I wanted to. My goal has never been to kill you, but to show you who I am. And so John does the same thing here, where he says that just like those were signs in Egypt, so now the one the miracles that I'm going to show you are signs that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, which is his whole point in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. So the same kind of parallels are here, 
in this story as well, which is why then, uh, or what unifies this whole book, uh, connects it all together, and then it connects it with the feasts. So what you'll notice is that at major moments in this book, and pretty much every single story will start with, and it was nearly the Passover, or it was the Feast of Booths, yeah. or it was the Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah. And it will always list these events. And what Jesus says about himself, the miracles that he does, always connect with the feast. Wow. Okay? So this whole book revolves around the story of Exodus, what God was doing, because all of the feasts come from the period of Exodus. Okay? The Feast of Booths, the Day of Atonement, the Passover Feast, um, all these feasts are originated in and laid out in the, law, the books of the law. Okay? Um, the only one that there may be a connection with that isn't is the Feast of Purim, uh, which comes up in Esther, and uh, we'll highlight that later on. So there's uh, um, also major connections with practices and um, stories from the Old Testament that come up here that don't come up anywhere else. And then when we look at the structure of this book, how is it structured? What, how is John laying it out? The structure of this book we see the first 12 chapters being a lot of public ministry. Okay, Jesus is very public in his, the first 12 chapters of this book. It's often called the book of signs, because that's when all the signs happen in this book. And then chapters 13 through 21 is referred to, or I'll refer to 13 through 20, as this private ministry of Jesus. And uh, that is sometimes referred to as the book of glory. So 13 through 20 will be the private ministry of Jesus. And then chapter 21 is an appendix to John. And we'll talk about that when we get there, um, maybe on Wednesday. <clears throat> and with these, with these stories then, so the, they follow this pattern of how the first 12 chapters are laid out between seven signs and seven discourses. Okay, so we have these seven signs throughout the, the gospel. And most of these signs, if you, you look at just the traditional seven, they are laid out in the first 12 chapters of this book, which is why those chapters are called the book of signs. But then there is the, this last sign, the eighth sign of his resurrection, which is the greatest sign of him being Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, is the resurrection. Now, um, the only one that I would, uh, would adjust here would be the walking on water. Because all of the signs that Jesus does are public signs for people to see that he is the Christ. Okay? The walking on water is done just privately with his disciples. He's on a, just in a boat with them. Right? So he, it's not really a convincing moment. I would rather say the crucifixion is the, last, the seventh sign of Jesus in here. Sign demonstrating who he is and what he has come uh, to do. So these signs pointing towards him. John doesn't use the word miracles. Okay. He uses the word signs, and signs are to be a what? A sign. Right? They point you towards something. Okay? Signs point you in a direction. But once you have arrived at that destination, you no longer need the sign. Okay? So these signs are pointing people towards who Jesus is. That's the whole point. And then we have these seven discourses. And the first one being born, the born from above discourse with Nicodemus, the living water discourse with the woman at the well. The unity of the Father and the Son in chapter 5, bread of life after the feeding of the 5,000, uh, true light and his children in chapter 8, uh, the true shepherd in chapter 10, and then uh, the hour coming for the Son of Man in chapter 12. And these will often fit with one of the signs that have been done for a lot of them. In the second half of the book, chapters uh, 13 through 20, <clears throat> we get a much more narrow focus. Okay, so chapters 1 through 12, very broad, very big, public, um, a lot going on. Chapters 13 through 20 are very narrow. In fact, chapters 13 through 20 happen in about a 12-hour period. Okay, so chapters 1 through 12 is three years. 13 through 20, about 12 hours. I mean, up until, the, the crucif or, uh, until Jesus is buried. So I guess chapters 13 through 19, uh, about 12 hours. Okay, and <clears throat> Jesus meets with his disciples privately. He's arrested privately. He's put on trial privately, and he's sentenced to death privately. Okay. We'll, we'll look at all those things, but this the trial of Jesus is incredibly hush hush. They're trying to keep it very very quiet, and they do all of it before the city wakes up. Right? They're trying to get Jesus on the cross as early as possible. 
so that nobody can object. Okay. And then chapter 20, we have the resurrection and uh, the purpose of the book. And then chapter 21 as an appendix that answers some questions that the church seemed to have by the close of the first century that still remained unanswered. And we'll see what those might have been. Now, there are a couple of difficulties just to be aware of in the Gospel of John that people bring up from time to time. The first is the discourses. Jesus talks a lot in John. If your Bible has red letters, or if you've ever seen a red letter Bible, there is a ton of red letters in John. Because pretty much all he's doing is talking. This whole book. So, why is that a problem? Well, John, writing about 70 years after the fact, how can he write so precisely what Jesus had said 70 years earlier? Right? The book of John takes about two hours to read from start to finish. How can John remember all of that in such precise detail? Okay. Now, are those really Jesus' words or are they John's words? In the ancient world and in ancient writing styles, which are very different from our own, there is no difference. The authors in the ancient world did their best to reproduce what was actually said at the moment by the speaker, recreating the atmosphere, the tone in which it was said. And so when speeches are reproduced in historical writings, they do so based off of eyewitness accounts. Okay, so Peter's speech at Pentecost, Luke wasn't there. Right? Maybe he could have talked to Peter. Maybe Peter is dead by the time Luke writes Acts. We're just not sure. But he could talk to eyewitnesses who were there, who heard what he said, and be able to piece together the speech that Peter had gave. Okay? John, probably similarly, putting together what Jesus had said. Okay? Um, that doesn't discount it or make it any less authoritative. That is uh, the writing style that God chose to use in the ancient world to write his scriptures that we have today. Okay? So there, there is sometimes the, the issue there, and people more have an issue because they're reading the scriptures from a 21st century perspective instead of first century understanding. Okay. The next one is chronology. Can anybody think of one thing in the Gospel of John that makes it chronologically difficult? Chapter 2, Jesus flips the tables. In all the other Gospels, that happens as soon as he arrives in Jerusalem at the end of the Gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record that event, and it's right at the end of the Gospel. For John, it's one of the first things Jesus does. So, is it a out of chronological order? Or did Jesus do it twice? Okay. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus has a one-year ministry. In the Gospel of John, Jesus has a three-year ministry. And the reason we gauge that is off of Passover feasts. In the Gospel of John, there are three separate Passover feasts that Jesus attends. Okay. As a Jewish man, that was required of him to go up. And so he goes once in chapter 2, he'll go again um, in chapter 8 or so, and then uh, in chapter 12, he'll go up again, which is the one where he's crucified. All the other Gospels only record one Passover feast, and that's the Passover feast where he is crucified. So that is one other dilemma that people sometimes um, will bring up. But uh, the, other, the important thing to know, now that you guys are well aware of this coming to the end of um, your school, is that Jewish writers are not as concerned with chronology as they are, are concerned with thematic purposes at times. And so they will take things out of chronological order to prove a thematic point. So could John have been doing that at times? Potentially, it seems quite likely um, that he is doing that from time to time. <clears throat> the next ones uh, are the sayings of Jesus. These are a bit different from the discourses. Uh, because what you have is this term, eternal life, showing up repeatedly in the Gospel of John, and it is incredibly sparse in the other Gospels. Hardly any of them mention eternal life. But they will talk about the kingdom of God. Okay? And the kingdom of God comes up a ton, but in the Gospel of John, the kingdom of God is only mentioned about ten times in the whole Gospel. Whereas in the Gospel of Matthew, it will be mentioned as kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God. 
and it will come up more than 50 times in the gospel. Okay, so you have these things of, well, how is Jesus referring to the things he's talking about? And it's probably likely that eternal life and the kingdom of God are seen as synonymous by the disciples. Okay? So that's, that's one of the things um, here. So these kind, the kind of language is a little different, um, varying on the gospel. So let's uh, jump in and take a look at chapter 1. Any questions on anything that I've said about background stuff or about the structure? Something like that. Okay. So we'll go a little slower through the prologue of the book than we will through the rest of the book because there's quite a number of things to talk about here. So chapter 1, verses 1 through 18 is called the prologue, and this is the very beginning of the Gospel of John that sets the context for the rest of the Gospel. Um, I don't know if Bill showed uh, last week, but Paul's prayers at the beginning of his letters will usually introduce you to all of the themes for the entire letter. So if you pay attention to the first paragraph of what Paul is saying, you will be able to pick up on all those things as you go through the letter. John does the same thing. In fact, he introduces you to pretty much every single theme he's going to bring up in this gospel in the first 18 verses. Wow. Okay? Showing you his whole purpose in writing. And so you get a very clear direction of where this gospel is going from this prologue. So we'll spend a little bit more time in the prologue to talk about it. So where does he start? John 1.1. 1, 1. Someone read that for us. That's enough. In the beginning. Where else does that come up? Genesis. Okay? That's what John is expecting you to think. In the beginning. Okay? This is the story of Genesis. He wants you to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible and say, we're going to start from the very beginning. Okay? So he lays it out from who was there at the beginning. God. Right? God was there at the beginning. Okay, so he's saying in the beginning, just as it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in the beginning was the word. Okay, and he's going to go into this idea then of what was there at the beginning. So you should be thinking right back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, start of the story. And that's where John is laying us out here. And so he'll say in the beginning was the word. Now, the word that he uses, this word uh, logos, is ripe with meaning. Okay. The word logos uh, had incredible depths of meaning, not only for Greeks, but also Jewish thinkers as well. Okay. For the Greek thinkers, they viewed the word or idea of logos as the philosophical center of, of the universe. The, the center of all rational being was referred to by the simple word logos. Okay. So that, that word gave everything its, its meaning. It gave us our rationality and our understanding, our ability to reason. And that's where... Logos is seen at. Now, for the Jews, on the flip side of things, their kind of thought about what how God had created the world is embodied in this word wisdom. Okay, um, God's wisdom and how He uh, imbued wisdom into the world. Now, there is a Greek or a, a Jewish philosopher before the time of Jesus named Philo, and he also talks about how wisdom and he equates it with the idea of logos. So, for the Jews as well. The whole idea of Logos carried with it this, again, idea of God's creative power and was the center of God's creation in Torah and throughout the rest of the Old Testament as being his wisdom. So <clears throat> carries with it that, that creative power, the prophetic power of God. And when John uses words, he's using words ripe with meaning in his writings. And Logos is no exception to grab the attention of the readers in the very first words of the book to talk about who Jesus was. And that in the center of everything created, that that is Jesus. Okay, so that's where he starts off his gospel. And he'll continue on. Well, I'm just going to read through um, the, the verses as we go along in this prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. <clears throat> and this idea of witness is going to be a very key theme to the Gospel of John 
And John is seen as the first witness. Okay? Now, in the Old Testament, to bear proper testimony about something, there had to be more than two witnesses to something. Okay? And what John is going to lay out is multiple witnesses. And when we get to chapter 5, this will be laid out in almost a courtroom setting. So John, what is John's whole goal in writing the gospel? To prove to you that Jesus is the Christ. Okay? So how is he going to do that? He's going to do that through signs and witnesses. Okay? And Jesus will talk about how his signs are a witness of who he is in chapter 5, as well as John the Baptist, the Father, uh, and the Word. So this is a, the introduction to this idea of being eyewitnesses. So testimony, testify, bearing witness are all uh, collective terms to refer back to this essential theme of testifying to Jesus' identity and how John is trying to convince people of who he was. The other theme that comes up here and started in verse 3 is this idea of light. Okay, so light is going to be another key theme that comes up in the gospel. It's used 21 times in the gospel of John. So the idea of light is very significant for John to bring up um, as he's going to make a strong contrast between darkness and light. Okay? So Jesus coming into the world, he's light coming into the world. John chapter 3 says that the light came into the world and the world loved darkness rather than the light. Okay? So Jesus is this light coming in to the world to be what Israel was supposed to be. Okay, Israel was supposed to be the light of the world, who were supposed to uh, bear the witness of God's character and his nature to the world through his goodness of what he had given them in the law. But as they failed to do so, and as instead they looked like all of the other nations, God says that he would replace them, and he would send one in their place to be that light. And Jesus is that light that then shines into all of the darkness. And no, as John says here, no darkness overcomes him. And so you want to pay attention to that as you go through the gospel. When does Nicodemus come to Jesus? John chapter 3, he comes at night. Okay, so you've got Nicodemus coming to Jesus, seeking the light of the world at night. Or when uh, Judas goes out after the supper in chapter 13 of John, it says, and Judas went out and it was night. Okay. So these, you want to pay attention to light, darkness, uh, day, night contrasts in the Gospel of John because they're done so very intentionally and John's trying to clue you into a theme from the beginning. <clears throat> so the next paragraph, we'll talk about uh, the true children of God. Okay, 10 through 12. Starting in verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. <clears throat> so a couple of, of things here. The way John will use the world, the term the world, is to refer to all people. Okay. Um, it is uh, the, uh, this location here, but not just a location, but usually a people group. Okay. So it is used uh, to identify Jews and Gentiles all together. They did not recognize him. So he came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. But any who did receive him, he gave them the right to become what? Children of God. Who are the children of God? Israel. Exodus chapter 4, God says that Israel is like his firstborn son. And Israel has always been considered the children of God. Okay? He has considered them his children. As he took them out of slavery, he cared for them and looked after them. Okay? So as the Exodus story is vital for our understanding of this book, so goes back this whole, the origins of Israel as a people was being children of God. So we'll get this contrast that we'll, we'll highlight with Israel and the world then later on. But <clears throat> how are you now made a child of God? By receiving Jesus. Okay, so it's not by being born into the right family. And that's what Jesus says, or what John says here from the beginning. Not born of blood, so it doesn't matter your physical heritage. Not born of the will of the flesh, so not just because your parents chose that you were born. 
nor of the will of man, but of God. God's desire to be his children. He gave the right for anybody who receives him. Okay? Now, this is an, such an important point because of how we talk to people and we share it when we share the gospel. Okay? Anybody who doesn't know Jesus out there is not his child. They are all orphans. He wants them to become his children. But nobody is a child of God until they're adopted into the family of God. How? By receiving Jesus. That's what the, that's what the gospel say. I mean, Paul says that, right? That we have become God's children through adoption. Okay? Now, all people have been created by God, but they are not his children yet. He wants them to become his children. So telling somebody who doesn't know Jesus that they are his child is not biblically correct. That's so good. Telling them God wants you to become his child is correct and oftentimes more inviting. And the important thing about it is that he chose them first. And that's the more profound thing about being God's child and being adopted into his family and receiving him is that he did it first. He said, I want you first. All you have to do is receive me. Okay? And so John is saying here, the whole game has changed. God is making a new family. And the new family is not by the blood. It's not by blood. It's not by your will. It's not by what just you want. It's by your choice wow. to come to him, to, be re- to receive what he has already given. And that, it, it's such an important point, I think, in our evangelism. Um, in sharing the gospel, because that's what uh, what Jesus has said. We want to be true to his word. Okay. <clears throat> and in here he says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. Now this is just an important uh, concept for us here, is that the, sorry, the idea of believing in Jesus' name <clears throat> is how John will talk about faith in the gospel. So when we talk about faith, this is the word, This word pistis in Greek is the word that we uh, translate as faith. And John will never use the noun faith. Okay? So he only ever uses the verb faith to believe, to have faith, to put your trust in something. And what John is trying to show is that faith is not a static concept to be possessed. It's a way of life. Wow. Now, faith, the, the idea of faith sometimes can be hard for us to define. What is faith? And such, such words as trust might come up. You know, I think it's a great way of referring to faith, trusting what Jesus said, and that reflects the way that we live our lives. But how was this word used at the time of John and Paul and the other apostles in the first century? When they used the word pistis to talk about what they're doing towards Jesus, what do they mean by it? How was the rest of the world using the word faith or the the word pistis in Greek? And most of the time they use it in the idea of loyalty or allegiance. You have faith in a king means you are loyal to them. It means you give your allegiance to them. When you think of loyalty, what do you think of? What's like the first thing you think of? For most people, it's a dog. (laughs) Right? Most people think uh, dogs are loyal, right? They follow their owners. They they defend them. If they're stuck in in the snow, the dog stays with them, right? If they're in a car accident, the dog is, is right there, doesn't leave the owner's side, right? Dogs are loyal, right? And it's that kind of image that we want to have as we follow Jesus. It's not just... It's not just a belief that he is alive. God doesn't need people to believe in him. It doesn't make him any more real. You understand that? Whether people believe in him or not, he doesn't care because he's still going to be real. What he needs is faith. What he asks for is people's faith. And what he says is how you become a child of God is you put your faith in him. You give him your loyalty, your allegiance, your trust. And that is what brings us into the family of God. His adoption, his choice first, and then we receive him, right? And so this is, this is what John's trying to get at, you guys. It's, it's so important, I think, uh, just for our concept of Christianity, 
and as we follow Jesus, is, is what does it mean to have faith in him? And when we tell people what faith looks like, do we present it in a way of walking with Jesus, or is it just a belief that he exists? Could you imagine Jesus going to the disciples at the boat and saying, believe in me? No, he says, follow me. In the next line, as John continues here, um, he'll say, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. Glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth, which he'll elaborate on in the rest of the paragraph. But here he says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is important against early church heresies because there were church heresies or, or heresies against the church that claimed that Jesus was not actually human, but he was just a phantom. And he was like a ghost because God can't actually die, you know, or that Jesus wasn't actually God because he died. Okay. Um, or that the spirit of God came upon a man, Jesus, at his baptism and left him at the cross. Okay. And so when John says the word itself took on flesh is quite important. Okay. It, it, it eradicates the possibility of all of those heretical ideas. Yeah. That Jesus, Jesus was not a human in some capacity. Because even in Greek thought, they believed that gods could show up as humans. They didn't believe that they were humans, they were not incarnate, but they did believe they could show up as a human, which ties into what Pilate sees of Jesus later on in chapter 19. Joel will we'll highlight that when we get there as well. But the word that John uses here where he says he became flesh and he dwelt among us is an important one because of the Exodus story. Right. <laughs> the the word skenao means to live in a tent. Why is that important for the Exodus story? The tabernacle. Okay? The most important tent in the whole Bible is the tabernacle. What does God's tabernacle symbolize? His presence. His presence. Okay? The tabernacle is not just a temple. Okay? This is another important point. There is no word for temple in the Hebrew uh, language. The word they use is house. So the house of God is translated as the temple of the Lord. Okay? But when David says, you know, I want to build you a house in first or Second Samuel chapter uh, 7, he's saying, I want to build you a literal house. Because they treated temples as the houses of the gods. And so we translate that as temple to distinguish it from house just because we don't want to create that kind of idea of a our God living inside of a home, which is why Solomon says, we've built you this house, but you are bigger than the highest heavens and you could never fill this house, right? right? Or this house is not big enough to contain you, is what he says, right? So when they build a tent for God, what is the tent built like? It's gold, um, all woven beautifully, the way it's laid out, all the pillars, everything organized, the levels of holiness to be able to go into it. It's a palace, you guys understand that? It is, it's, not just, it's not a worship place as much as it is the dwelling of a king. When Egypt would set up their war camp, Pharaoh would camp in the middle, and his servants would camp directly around him, and then the soldiers would camp around the servants. Yahweh sets up his tabernacle in the center of the camp with the Levites around him and all the tribes around the Levites. Okay? This is a king. He's setting his, his throne up. That's why the Ark of the Covenant is called the Mercy Seat, the throne of God. Okay? So... He dwells above the cherubim, which is where his throne is at. So when Jesus comes and he tents among the people, the, the whole idea is God's presence dwelling as the king of Israel in the midst of his people. Okay? That's the whole point of what John is trying to say here. There's a lot of other words he could have used for dwelling. Um, various verbs or, or uh, nouns to say that he was dwelling with them. But he chose the specific one to highlight Jesus as the tabernacle. Now, in the rest of this prologue, the way John will close it out is like this. So in the, in the parentheses, John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. And that's just uh, John's uh, elaboration on where Jesus is from. So verse 16, for from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, which is not a, a jab at the law, by the way. 
Um, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father, uh, sorry, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Okay. So that last sentence should be read about Jesus. Okay. Now, why is it important to bring up Moses at this moment? Okay. How did Moses see God? Face to face is an idiom to refer to friendship. He didn't see him face to face. He spoke to him face to face as one speaks to a friend. So that's not a literal statement, it's an idiomatic statement. Because God says you cannot see my face, he says if you if you look like you can't look upon my face, right? Which is why he hides him in the cleft of the rock, and then he watches him pass by and he sees his back. Okay? So Moses only got to watch as God walked away from him. Why is that so important? Because now it says that Jesus was in the bosom of the Father. He was leaning upon the Father's chest. Okay? The only other time this word is used is in John chapter 13, verse 25, where it says that John was leaning on the bosom of Jesus. And it says that Jesus can make the Father known because he was leaning back on the Father. He was in the Father's bosom. So the implications are when John says, I leaned, the disciple whom Jesus loved leaned back on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper, he can make Jesus known because he was leaning into the bosom of Jesus. The same way that Jesus makes the Father known because he was leaning into his bosom. And the word that um, they use for make known is the, the Greek word exegetomai. And it's the word where we get our English word exegesis from, which is the word we use for biblical interpretation. So interpretation of scripture, the technical term is exegesis. So um, that's not exegesis, by the way. Um, it's uh, E-X, I'll spell <laughs> This E might be an I. I, I can't remember. Um, so it is, it's the technical term for interpretation. So Jesus is making known the Father. He's exegeting the Father to us. And that's why Jesus will say, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay. And he can make him known because he's been leaning into him. So that's John's prologue. He sets you up for the whole book. And it's a beautiful setup. Okay. So as the, the prologue wraps up and we move into the, the rest of chapter one, there's a couple things I'll highlight here. <clears throat> um, the, the first is this phrase that John says about Jesus, right? So after Jesus had been baptized, he points to him in verse 29 and says, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay. Now, that might not be confusing to you, but if you are a Jew, that's confusing. Okay. And the reason is because if you know your Old Testament well, I should say if you know your Old Testament really well, that's really confusing. Because what is the day where all the sins of Israel are forgiven? Atonement. Day of Atonement. What kind of animal is sacrificed on the Day of Atonement? A goat. <laughs> okay. It's a goat. So the technical phrase that John should be saying is, behold, the goat that takes away the sins of the world, right? And, you know, we're like, oh, the greatest of all time, right? He's the goat, right? But, um, but, uh, but John's mixing metaphors here, okay? When was the lamb sacrificed for, all, for the nation? Passover, okay? So he's taking the Day of Atonement and Passover and blending them together, okay? Now, that, that should stand out to us again because... When, John, or when Jesus in John chapter 10 says, nobody takes my life from me, I lay my life down freely. Okay? That's really important. Okay? That's really important because people uh, re in recent times, I don't see it as much right now, but a few years ago, have used Jesus as a political figure to talk about someone who was unjustly murdered by his government. Okay? Jesus was not murdered. He sacrificed himself. He said, I choose when to give my life. Nobody takes it from me. Murder is the unjust taking of somebody's life. Okay? So Jesus sacrificed himself. He was not murdered in that sense, in that sense of the word. Okay? Um, and so <clears throat> that should be important to us. Okay? It, why is it important to us? Because if Jesus is the one who chooses when he gives his life, and he gave his life at Passover, then we've really got to think through Passover all the implications of it. 
Because when we talk about Jesus, we say, oh, he died for your sins. Okay, well, then why did he die at Passover and not the Day of Atonement? If he only died for your sins, he should have just died at Rosh Hashanah, the Day of Atonement, in September. Instead, he dies at Passover. For us, Easter, yesterday, right, when he's resurrected. But last week, the, the, the Passover season, that's when he gives his life. Okay? Salvation is not just about your sins being paid for. Salvation is freedom from an oppressive taskmaster of sin to live a life as God's children seeking the promised land. Being given the law of God written on your hearts instead of tablets of stone. Right? The whole life of a Christian is about walking with Jesus. Right? It's not just about that moment of your sins being paid for. Well, that did happen, and I think that's what John is getting at with the mixing of metaphors here. The point is, when Jesus died, he is the, he's the lamb. He's the Passover lamb. Right? He's not just the Day of Atonement goat. Okay? So <clears throat> that's, what, that's what John is trying to get at here. Now he says, so that he might be revealed to Israel. And this will bring up an important point. Because we saw in chapter, or the earlier in chapter 1 that he wasn't received by his people. But anybody who did receive him was given the right to become a child of God. So the children of God being Israel then, the, the name Israel, the term Israel, will often be connected with those who faithfully follow Jesus. And so what he's tr- kind of saying is the, the new family of God, the new Israel is being formed around Christ. Not by blood, but by choosing of Jesus, which is Jesus' point to Nicodemus in chapter 3, where he's going to say, it doesn't matter who you've been born to. What matters is have you been born again? Have you been born from above? Okay. So those who are Israelites in this book are going to be seen kind of through the lens of faith, those who faithfully follow Jesus, where the term Jews will often be used in a derogatory sense for those who reject Jesus. Okay. Um, and sometimes that has bred anti-Semitism in the past, but that's not what John is trying to do. Okay. But it has happened through John's writings before. So let's look at uh, this story here, because we have, this, of course, the calling of uh, Andrew and Peter, and the renaming of Peter, but then you get the story with Nathaniel and Philip, who are two that are not mentioned in the other Gospels being called. So John's including a unique story here, and I think it's because of what it opens up for us all at the beginning of this book, because uh, Philip will come to Nathaniel and say, we found the Messiah, right? So from the beginning, we have this realization of Jesus and who he is, his identity. We found the one that Moses talked about. Right? This prophet, this Messiah who's coming. And what does Jesus say to Nathanael when he comes to him? He says, you are a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Yeah. Okay? That's not just a, a, a discussion of his ethnic identity. But I think it's a discussion of his faith in Christ. Right? That he would believe. Yeah. I've wondered in the past the tone in which Jesus would say that. Because it's after he says, like, does anything good come out of it? Mm-hmm. And then he says, behold. True Israelite. So I always read it being like, dang, is that a jab? Because like, oh, okay, yeah. So, or do you think he was just prophesying, I know that you are true? I think so. I think he's speaking to who Nathaniel is rather than what he has said. Okay. Yeah. So they have this conversation, and, uh, and I think that is the case because of uh, where Jesus goes, because in the next. Um, statement. He says, how do you know me? And Jesus says, you know, I saw you under the fig tree. And um, then Nathanael confesses him as the son of God, the king of Israel. Okay. So I think because of what you, where you see Nathanael going, that's probably why. So Jesus' response then is that you will see the angels of God ascending and descending. He's saying this to both Philip and Nathanael now. It's a plural in the Greek. And he says, you'll see the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Now, where else do we see angels ascending and descending? Jacob's, Jacob's ladder. Okay, great. Do you remember which city that happens at? Bethel. Good. The word Beth- Bethel, Bethel, means house of God. Okay, so when Jesus says, you will see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, what is he saying about himself? He's the house of God. Okay. What is the house of God? We just talked about this a moment ago. What's the house of God? The temple. 
Great. So Jesus is saying about himself, he is the temple. Why is that important? Because the only place where forgiveness was granted, the only place where healings took place, the only place where people met with God was the temple. So instead of people going to Jerusalem to meet God at the temple, now the temple is traveling to them. And so when miracles are happening in the Gospels, it's because Jesus is the dwelling place of God's presence. He is the temple in their midst. Okay, so he's trying to reform the perspective of uh, the Jews who have created a paradigm of God just living in Jerusalem, setting his name in Jerusalem, his presence just in Jerusalem, and now God is in their midst. Okay. So Jesus is the house of God, the temple, and he's redefining that, which is then what you get in chapter two, as Jesus will then say, you know, um, tear down this temple and it will be raised again in three days, right? That's what he's getting at as well, is that I am the dwelling place of God. And so we get four kind of titles or confessions of Jesus in the first chapter from other people's lips, that he is the Messiah, that he's the son of God, the king of Israel, and the son of man. Huge statements. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, and then we'll end class. Okay. So. <laughs> This is probably one of the most well-known stories in all of the Gospels, and even people who are not Christians know this story, uh, because Jesus makes alcohol for drunk people. Okay. So that, that kind of scenario, you know, people, of people who are not Christians can relate to that. You know, they kind of like that idea. Um, so, so that's why this story is so well-known, but um, there's a number of things to talk about in the, the wedding feast of, of uh, Cana in Galilee. The first that always strikes me, I, I don't know why, every time I read the story, I think about the fact that Jesus had so many friends. Yeah. He got invited to a wedding. He hadn't done any miracles yet. Mm-hmm. It's not like he's like the showman that you're like, hey, we've got Jesus here. You know, he's just, he's the stonemason from Nazareth. He's just a friend, you know, like he's got a life. He had a business. He probably had to do books. You know, he's crunching numbers. He's trying to get contracts. You know, he's, he's, he's probably not a carpenter because there's not enough trees in this area. He's probably a stonemason given the region he lived in. He's out there cracking stones and building walls. Uh, someone who would build like brick walls or um, build roads, uh, things like that. Um, there was a, a city that was built around, uh, that began being built around the time that Jesus was born, probably about, uh, I mean, we don't know when Jesus was born, but um, beginning of the first century, and uh, called Sepphoris. And it's likely that Jesus spent a lot of his time working there with Joseph. And uh, they did a, probably did a lot of the contracting and building projects there, which is probably also where Jesus would have learned Greek from, um, because they're working amongst Gentiles. So, so Jesus probably learned... Probably learned Greek because he had to work amongst people who spoke Greek. Um, yeah, so anyways. But that's Jesus. You know, that's why that's why they understand his humanity so much more, you know, than we might give him, uh, give him credit for oftentimes. <clears throat> but they're at this wedding feast, and the wine runs out, and, and Mary comes to Jesus and says, you know, can you, can you do something about this? Yeah. And uh, he's like, woman? You know, it's not my hour. Um, the, the way of Jesus talking back to Mary is a common way of, uh, of referral back to each other. So he's not being confrontational or anything like that. He's not using a term that um, is derogatory in any way just to say woman back to his mother. Um, just what they did. So, um, and the idiom that he says is a little challenging to translate um, where he, he says... Uh, it's translated at least in the ESV. Uh, what do you, what does this matter have to do with me? Where it actually says, um, it, it, the literal is like, who are you and I? You know, it's like, what do we have in common in this matter? Do we feel? Do you think we feel the same way about the situation? Um, is kind of the the response in that time. Now, what is this term? My hour. 
mean? Does this mean it's not my hour to reveal myself yet? Because this term comes up a lot in the gospel. Right? And I mean, you think of when Jesus' brothers come to him and they say, aren't you going to go up to the feast? And Jesus says, it's not my hour to go up to the feast. And then in the next verse, he's at the feast. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, what gives, Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, is this, what does this term mean? Well, the way it's used and referred to, it probably means the ultimate revelation of his identity, which he recognizes as his crucifixion. And so the moment where he recognizes his, his time to reveal himself will come much later on. We'll see that. But that's this, the idea of the theme of this hour going on. And we're introduced again um, to another theme that will come up a lot is water. Water is going to come up a ton in this gospel. So um, water starts here. We see it also in uh, the woman at the well. We see it in chapter 7 with the water being poured out and talked about living water there as well. So this is another, another theme uh, that will come up prominently throughout the gospel of John. So, in this story, we get this, this statement of Jesus then. So, Jesus responds, and he, she, uh, his mother tells the servants, you know, whatever he tells you, you, you listen to them. And, and Jesus so then he tells the servants, go and fill up these jars. Now, um, I'm going to have um, Jacob fill up a, just this cup for me with water um, while I talk, and I'll grab that. It's a dirty cup, don't worry about it. I'm not going to drink it. But yeah, you can fill up that cup for me. Um, and when they're filling up these jars, um, they... They take these jars, and these are stone jars used for purification. Okay, so when they take the or when Jews come to a feast, they always wash their hands and they'll ritually wash. And so the stone jars are are jars um, for ritual washing because a clay jar can get unclean and you have to destroy it, but a stone jar will not hold the uncleanness. So they use stone jars that have been carved out, and the stone jars um, are pretty heavy. Okay, these jars hold anywhere from about 20 to 30 gallons of water, which uh, in liters is about 75 to 110 liters. Okay. So they're very big. These are really big stone jars. Okay. And if you, if you think about the fact that um, one gallon of water is about eight pounds, or one liter of water is one kilogram, yes, then... Uh, then these jars are going to weigh about 200 pounds each, you know, 90 kg. Okay. So <clears throat> you, you've got some pretty heavy jars here. And when Jesus tells the, or tells the servants, go and fill up the jars with water, what do they do? Okay. I want you to look at the passage, John chapter 2, look at how they respond. What do they do when Jesus says to fill them up? They fill them to the brim. Now, when we ask somebody to fill something up for us, this is usually how full they'll fill it. Right? Almost to the top. Almost to the brim. Okay? These were not Jesus' servants. These people had no relationship to Jesus. They weren't his disciples. They weren't his servants. But they went to the utter extent of what Jesus asked them to do. They went to the most extreme degree of obedience to his request. And my question to us is then, as his children and his servants, to what degree of obedience do we go when he asks us to do something? Do we go to the fullest extent possible that we can go? And when he says fill it up, we say how full? You know? That that would be a response that just like Jesus, just like these servants that who filled it up to the brim, Jesus didn't ask them to do that. But they come back to the fullest extent possible, and say yes. And then that has got to be our response as well. So Jesus makes this wine, and and in a, a Jewish wedding, what they would do is they would serve the best wine first, so that people would be able to taste it, because. If you know, the more you drink, the, the more um, numb your palate becomes. And so if you've been drinking for a while, you don't taste the bad wine because you're numb. And so they always give the bad wine later because it's cheaper and easier and no one will notice. And so when the master of the feast says, wow, you've saved the best wine until last. This is not just the saving of a social situation. This is the preservation of reputation. That for the, uh, for the groom in this setting, 
his reputation would have been defaced in the community to have run out of wine at his own wedding. For, so for Jesus to then have provided enough wine, but to have gone above and beyond to make it even better than what they started with, shows the abundant provision for the people around him and demonstrates the groom's love for his community. And so when Jesus does this miracle, he's restoring it and make it even better. Okay? Now, when you think about this story, where is another time in the Bible where somebody turns water into a red liquid? The first sign of the Exodus. Okay? So this story should make you think of the Exodus. Right? Instead of the water turning to blood and being a judgment upon the Egyptians, Jesus turns the water into wine and blesses the community and res- uh, preserves reputation. Wow. And so the signs are pointing to the similar kind of Exodus story right. and how Jesus is not, uh, there's no judgment, Jesus is making it better for people. And it's a symbol of this abundant life that Jesus talked about in chapter 10. I came so that um, we don't have life and life abundant. Right? That's what he speaks to us. And that's this kind of idea. That Jesus is taking it and making it better. Okay. So, I think with that, it's a, a good place for us to close today. So let me pray for us, and we can eat some lunch. <laughs> Jesus, thank you so much. We're so, so grateful, Jesus, just for who you are, how you lived, how you love people well, just the, the way that you speak to people the way you interact with people. Jesus, we're so grateful for it. And I I pray, God, that as we go through the gospel, as we go through the the letters and and revelation this week, God, that our our hearts will be open and our eyes will be open to see you for who you say you are and not just who we want you to be. Mm -hmm. Jesus, I pray that that we would receive you fully for who you are, Jesus. I pray, God, that um, you would bless this class today um, as they go from here. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Wow, Linus.